Today we're taking a closer look at the misbegotten. And I know what you're thinking. You're one ugly mother- But what if I told you that I've learned something that's going to change how you look at them forever? That not only do they have a direct connection to the Crucible, they are strongly linked to Radigan himself. So, lend me your ear, good tarnished as I present to you my graduate studies level thesis on why we've all been sleeping on the Misbegotten. The Misbegotten are a mess. They have a mixture of scales, fur, feathers, claws, nice straight teeth. It's what would happen if a chicken, a lizard, a human, a wolf, and a handful of barnacles had a baby together. It just doesn't look right. And on top of being hideous, they're absolutely reviled in the lands between. They are treated as slaves and worse. It's said that their very existence is a punishment for having made contact with the Crucible, which is the primordial form of the Erd Tree, meaning the Crucible predated the Erd Tree as the original source of life and creation. Under the Crucible, all life was once blended together. Beasts came into being and were blessed with intelligence, some even a greater intelligence than was known to man. But as the Erd Tree flourished under the reign of Queen Merica and the new religion of the Golden Order was established, it became the only belief system permitted. The theocracy of the Erd Tree and the Golden Order pushed out all other beliefs and practices and established a new system based on grace. Any beings that seemed to have a connection to the Crucible were now labeled as impure, cursed, graceless, damned to a life of abuse, torture, and death. We see this with the Omen, the Albanorix, and the Misbegotten. The Omen and the Misbegotten both feature seemingly out-of-place characteristics, but it's these very features that are described as aspects of the Crucible. The Crucible talisman feature different kinds of traits, feathers, bony knots, and scales, and are described as a vestige of the Crucible of primordial life, born partially of devolution. It was considered a signifier of the divine in ancient times but is now increasingly disdained as an impurity as civilization has advanced. In the aspects of the crucible incantations, we see horns, tail, and breath, and these are all described as a manifestation of the Erd Tree's primal vital energies, an aspect of the primordial crucible. Seeing as how the Omen and the Misbegotten both have aspects of the primordial crucible, it's likely that eons ago, under the reign of the ancient dragons, dragons being the epitome of horns, tail, and breath. The omen of misbegotten might have been heralded in the highest regard, even called divine. But this is knowledge that's long been gone since the establishment of the Erd Tree. No other competing belief systems are permitted under America's reign. And anything that's a reminder of the original primordial crucible that predated the conception of the Erd Tree would be seen as competition to the Golden Order. So the omen and the misbegotten had to be kept in check, thus the lie about them being cursed. Omen babies would have their horns cut off, many of them perishing during this horrible mutilation, and the misbegotten were doomed to a life of enslavement and mistreatment from their birth to their death. They were hated for essentially being the closest expression of the crucible, but that's a secret that would have only been known to Merica who waged those initial wars against her proclaimed enemies of the Erd Tree. This is backed up by the language of the winged misbegotten ashes. The misbegotten are held to be a punishment for making contact with the Crucible. Held to be, purported, assumed, believed. It's the explanation everyone's been given because the Erd Tree is good and flawless and bountiful and you're either touched by grace or you're not. And what better way to oppress the naturally divine than to make them and everyone else believe that their very existence is a curse. The first time I saw the Misbegotten was at Castle Morn, and I was instantly intrigued by the scene. A castle overthrown by the abused and mistreated servants who have conquered their former masters in the most grisly of ways. We learn that they led a rebellion and slaughtered all of the castle's inhabitants. The text on their weapons says that their actions are steeped in resentment, their attacks are wild and relentless. It paints a picture of an abused being that has just finally snapped. Someone that's lashing out with all of this insane hatred built up over the years. You can find several misbegotten that are cowering and trembling as they shield themselves, just to illustrate to us how much they've been abused and mistreated throughout their life. 
The misbegotten that we come across at this point in time have had enough. They are no longer fearful and they're fighting back. In fact, the Scaly and Leonine variants are the ones doing the scaring now. And the appearance traits for the Leonine are especially interesting. The face is reminiscent of a lion and the eyes are incredibly humanoid and they have these bright red manes. Even the more common variation of the misbegotten have red on them, on their legs and in their wings. If you've played this game, you know by now that red is a very significant hair color. It's the hair color of Radigan, and it's always referenced in game as a way to draw attention to him. You see it on the helms of his children, Radon and Melania, you see it on Ronnie's corpse, you even see it on the helms of their red mane in Clean Rot Knights as homage to their commanders. Radigan's red wolf has the same fiery red hair as do the other red wolves we come across. Radigan's red hair becomes his most identifying feature, and I'm convinced they do this throughout the entirety of the game to land one of the most jaw-dropping revelations, that Radigan's red hair is a trait of the giants. So why do the Leonine Misbegotten have red manes? There is a cave in the consecrated snowfield called Cave of the Forlorn, and upon entering, you immediately see the frozen corpse of a dragon. And we know this isn't just a random design placement. Nothing in this game is randomly placed. And looking at it, it reminded me so much of the appearance of the misbegotten. The scales, the feathers, tail. This comparison is definitely here to make some kind of connection between them. The cave is littered with misbegotten, and the boss for the area is the misbegotten crusader, a leonine variation that wields the golden order greatsword. This sword has huge significance to Radigan. It was first given to him by Rinala when they were married, and he later modified it during his reign as Elden Lord to symbolize the tenets of the Golden Order. This is an extremely important item to Radigan, and I can't imagine that a misbegotten somehow managed to steal it and then hide away in the frozen hell of the consecrated snowfield. This is made even more confounding when you look at the swords carried by other Leonine variants. They carry the Iron Greatsword, which is a unique weapon to them, and the shape seems very reminiscent of the Golden Order Greatsword. In Lindell, you come across a group of misbegotten, and they are all in the act of worship. Some even appear to be mourning. And there is one particular scene that is extremely revealing. It's kind of off to the side and hidden, but here we see a misbegotten praying to a statue of a man draped in a robe that appears to be holding a very similar looking sword. And overlaying the images, it really does look like the same sword. So who is this mysterious man depicted in this statue? This statue that just so happens to line the walkways of the royal capital and is featured in archways several stories high, a champion in one version and presented as a scholar in another. This has to be Radigan. These statues perfectly represent his transformation from an undefeated champion of war to a fundamentalist man of faith. Which would mean that the greatsword he's holding in this statue would be the one that Rinala gave to him when they were wed. And overlaying the Golden Order greatsword on the sword in the statue, it seems to be a perfect fit. So now the question is, what on earth is the connection between Radigan and the Misbegotten? They obviously revere him so much, they're praying to him and worshipping statues of him, they've modeled their sword after his. Finding this out has made me question whether or not the Misbegotten we see at the Halig Tree are even there worshipping Mikola as a savior or are they just loyal to him because he's the son of their hero? So I have a theory, the first of many. I don't want to get into the debate about whether or not Radigan has giant's blood in him. I'll save that for another video. But regardless, he despised his red hair and what it represented. And it's even proposed to be a curse as we learned from the fire giant braid. We've seen how the term curse has been thrown around the lands between as a way to falsely persecute those that express aspects of the crucible. So is having red hair a curse or a curse? Air quotes. If red hair was seen as a curse because it signified descent from the giants whom America hated and wiped out of existence, then there's a possibility it might be another aspect relating to the primordial crucible. Ordovis was one of the two top foremost of the crucible knights, 
In their greatsword reads, its red tint exemplifies the nature of primordial gold, said to be close in nature to life itself. We see this color in the armor sets of these Crucible Knights as well, and the color is described as red-tinged gold. It's a much different kind of gold than that of the Golden Lineage in the Golden Order. So if we assume that red hair relates to the Primordial Crucible, and because of this it's been touted as a curse, if the misbegotten with their red hair see that red-headed Radigan was elected to the status of Elden Lord despite this curse, he'd be the poster child for having made it. Sharing some kind of trait with the Elden Lord himself would be huge to a group of beings that have been eternally mistreated and viewed as scum. And maybe their loyalty to him meant something, and maybe Radigan entrusted them with the Golden Order Greatsword to signify some kind of alliance. Maybe he felt he had a connection to them over some kind of secret shared heritage. Alternatively, another theory is that after the Shattering, Radigan abandoned the Golden Order threw his greatsword out the window, and it landed at the feet of some misbegotten who looked up and thought it was a sign from their savior. Another weapon-related observation involves the daggers carried by some of the winged variants. This isn't a dagger that is dropped and it's not accessible to us, I couldn't find any weapon that was similar in design, so it's really interesting to me to have this uniquely designed and detailed dagger that isn't a drop for us, but it's just unique to the misbegotten. So if anyone has any ideas about this weapon, definitely share below. But not everyone hated the misbegotten. There is a notable fight in the unsightly catacombs in which you fight a Leonine warrior in the company of the perfumer Trisha. We learn from her spirit summon that she was a healer who dedicated her efforts to treating misbegotten, omen, and all those seen as impure. When her efforts failed, she was their companion as they died watching over them to ensure they could pass peacefully, free of pain. This further explains why the misbegotten you see in Lindell are in the company of a perfumer, and the language of them being seen as impure further confirms my idea that they were the opposite of. However, the most significant of all misbegotten is the one imprisoned in the round table hold, smithing master Hug, who becomes one of our strongest supporters and friends. Hug is the only misbegotten we meet that we actually get to talk to, and he tells you that he's been imprisoned here, and he's been tasked by Queen Merica herself to build a weapon strong enough to kill the gods. We never find out why he's imprisoned, but I've got another theory about that too. Hug is a blacksmith, and we learn from the description of his hammer that the art of smithing is said to have originated among the giants. War Counselor E.G. was also a blacksmith, and we learn from his hammer that trolls descended from giants, and in the distant past, the art of smithing was considered divine. In Stormvale Castle, we find the brick hammer, and we learn that it was once wielded by a laborer who led a rebellion and later became a champion himself, and that the strength of a giant was required to wield it. So what group of beings do we see that have been enslaved in some way? The misbegotten and also the trolls. You frequently find trolls around the map as having been impaled through the chest and forced to drag these heavy coffins. So we can probably narrow down the owner of this hammer to a misbegotten or a troll. My first theory is that the laborer at Stormvale who led a rebellion and became a champion is none other than Hugh. This misbegotten rebellion at Stormvale would foreshadow the one to occur decades later at Castle Morn, but unlike Morn, the Stormvale uprising failed. If Hugh was indeed the owner of the brick hammer and thus the leader of this rebellion, this may have been the reason why he's imprisoned. But instead of killing him as punishment, Merica saw his value as a blacksmith and kept him prisoner in the round table hold. He can be seen praying at one point and asks Merica for her forgiveness. If this is his story, then this would mean that the misbegotten have giant's blood in them, and thus the description of Hugh's hammer now has some context. My other, more simple theory is that the troll near the grafting station, the one that is being eaten, is the owner of the hammer. But when is this game ever simple? I like my first theory better. The thing that the trolls and misbegotten have in common is that both groups have produced blacksmiths, and we've learned that smithing was a divine art that originated with the giants. If these items in relation to Hugh and Eiji are connected, 
then I think this points to them sharing common ancestry in the giants. As the ages went by and the Erd Tree stamped out all other religions and civilizations and beliefs, this important heritage of the misbegotten would remain unknown forever. The true nature of their divinity and connection to the primordial crucible was withheld from them. And the persecution as allowed under the age of the Erd Tree is an example of how awful America and the Golden Order are. I've been really interested in the themes of persecution and discrimination in Elden Ring since I did a video on the Albanorix, so I guess this is kind of my second video on that subject. I really enjoyed putting this presentation together about the Misbegun because it just illustrates how thoughtfully every character in this game is constructed. And I'd love to hear your inputs and interpretations on this subject. And if you want to see more in-depth looks at some of the other enemy groups, definitely let me know which ones. I've been looking at the giants next, so I might do that, but I am fully open to suggestions. Thanks so much for watching everyone and for your support. And until next time, bye.